These modern missile systems bear little resemblance to the horse-drawn cannons field artillerymen still talk about. World War II changed all that. The impact of the German V-2s on London also had a profound impact on the field artillery. The artillery realized it needed the vastly superior range of the rocket-propelled missiles if it was to provide fire support over rapidly enlarging battlefield areas. So, soon after the war, development began on a whole new family of missile weapons. The latest in this line is Lance, one of two missile systems in use by the artillery today. It is shown here in its primary configuration, aboard the self-propelled launcher, or SPL. The SPL is a diesel-powered, tracked vehicle that carries all equipment necessary to fire the lance. Once it has been positioned on its pre-surveyed firing point, and its road wheels locked out to form a stable firing platform, lance can be made ready to fire in just a few minutes. Operational since 1972, Lance is designed for general support to the Corps commanders. It is 20 feet long and 22 inches in diameter and weighs approximately 2,900 pounds with a nuclear warhead and approximately 3,400 pounds with a non-nuclear warhead. The main assemblage contains the liquid propellant tanks, the rocket engine, and the gyro-stabilized inertial guidance system. Two, Lance is fired. One. Fire. Once the missile has reached the necessary velocity, 
the larger booster engine shuts down, while a small sustainer engine continues to burn. During flight, the guidance system corrects for variations in air density and winds, and keeps the missile on course to the target. This might be a large troop concentration, an airfield, a communications complex, an enemy missile site, or some other critical military installation. The non-nuclear warhead carries a cargo of 836 bomblets, which are released above the ground and explode on impact. Designed to work in conjunction with the SPL is the loader transporter, another configuration of the same tracked vehicle. It can carry two complete Lance missiles, and by use of its fixed length boom, can transfer the missile to the launchers. Both the SPL and the loader transporter are highly mobile vehicles. With their watertight hulls and a rubber shroud covering the road wheels, they can negotiate inland waterways. And they are air transportable. Additional versatility has been built into the land system by making its launch fixture removable. Within minutes, the launch fixture can be converted by attaching wheels, jacks, and tow bar from the mobility kit to produce the launcher zero link or LZL. This is a lightweight auxiliary launcher configuration that can be towed or carried by medium helicopters during air mobile operations either as an internal or external load. Reloading the LZL in the field during air mobile operations when the LT is not available is accomplished through use of this portable tripod hoist. In fact, all essential elements of the Lance missile system are air transportable by helicopter. Elevate! Its elevating and traversing hand wheels are entirely hand operated. The Lance missile system is virtually as mobile and reliable as cannon artillery and gives the field commander a versatile, quick action weapon that can hit distant targets with great accuracy and with devastating impact. The Pershing 1-8 is the field artillery's longest range-guided missile. As you can see, Pershing takes over where Lance leaves off and provides the theater commander with a quick response nuclear delivery system with a range effective up to 740 kilometers. Because it uses a solid propellant, Pershing has a much shorter reaction time than earlier liquid propellant rockets. Moreover, it travels further with greater accuracy and with a larger payload. Yet, it is considerably shorter, only 34 feet in length. Let's look at the four sections which make up this missile. The bottom two sections contain the first stage and second stage solid propellant rocket motors. Each stage has air fins and jet vanes which correct for deviations in the flight path. The third section is the guidance and control section. It contains the heart of the missile's inertial guidance system, 
a gyro-stabilized platform which is constantly oriented to the desired flight path. Here also is an onboard computer and devices to determine direction and velocity. The fourth section contains the nuclear warhead. Pershing is transported and launched from this four-wheeled semi-trailer called the Erector Launcher. The system's prime mover is this powerful multi-fuel truck tractor, M757. Together, these two vehicles provide all the pneumatic, mechanical, hydraulic, and electrical assemblies needed to transport, orient, erect, and launch the missile. The Pershing can be moved over rough roads. And across open terrain. These vehicles have a cruising range of 300 miles and are capable of fording many inland waterways. Each Pershing firing platoon has three erector launchers plus their supporting vehicles. This vehicle transports the programmer test station and power station, which is carried aboard a modified version of the same truck tractor. Accompanying this platoon is the battery control central and the long-range Track 80 radio set. The Pershing Battalion is one of the Army's largest, with almost 1,500 men needed to maintain and operate its 36 launchers and support equipment. When the battalion is deployed to the field, each of its missiles is programmed on an assigned target. In order to hit that target, the missile guidance platform must be aligned to the firing aspect. This alignment process is performed fully automatically by the automatic reference unit once its low-powered laser has been locked onto the missile's guidance platform. The missile warhead, which has been carried in this handling device during transport, is swung around, lifted up, and made it to the guidance and control section. <laughs> Meanwhile, the ground support power station has been started. So now the operator of the programmer test station can begin the countdown. That means he's going to program the computer, a sophisticated third-generation model which will calculate the data to hit the target, program the missile guidance computer, and test all elements of the missile and its controlling systems. Station on for missile one. Select missile. Missile one selected. Holding for confidence count. Enter set number. Flying as Mr. Mills. 1454.029. Signals from the computer go by cable to the sequential launch adapter, a new modification of the Pershing system. Basically a switching unit, it allows the PTS operator to select any one of the three missiles to count. During the countdown, the missile is actually run through a simulated launch in flight by the computer. 
Control services, gyro units, and electrical units are all checked to make sure they are functioning properly. Meanwhile, the track 80 radio set has been positioned and put into operation. Its 8-foot parabolic antenna provides reliable communications up to 160 kilometers. All communications flow into the battery control central. From within this expandable van, the battery commander is able to exercise control over the nine missiles of his firing platoons and maintain contact with his battalion and other army elements. At this point, the firing platoon is on quick reaction alert. That means its missiles have been preconditioned on targets in a very short countdown, quick count may be used to fire. Should a fire mission come in, the battery commander is ready to carry it out within minutes. A quick count is used to prepare the missile for immediate launch. Because Pershing is a nuclear weapon system, elaborate safeguards have been built in to ensure against its misuse. The key is located in a safe under two-man control to prevent any one individual from activating the missile. When the short countdown nears the end, the firing sequence is initiated. Because it has its own inertial guidance system, the Pershing neither receives nor sends any instructions once it's in flight. Therefore, it is effectively immune to enemy jamming. The onboard computer constantly collects in-flight data, compares it with a desired flight fan, and then maneuvers the jet vanes and air fins to keep the missile on course. At the time the first stage rocket motor burns out, it has boosted the missile into a ballistic curve toward the target. After a coast period, explosive bolts sever the splice band which holds the sections together and first stage separation occurs. The second stage rocket motor ignites and pushes the missile onward. When the missile has attained a certain velocity at a predetermined point in space, the splice band is blown and the thrust reversal ports are fired. The second stage is then shut down by blowing gaping holes in its side. After warhead separation, a small rocket motor imparts a spin to the warhead to provide stability in flight. From this point on, it acts like any other artillery projectile, following an established ballistic curve to the target. At a preset point, for either an air or surface burst, there is nuclear detonation. As you have seen, our Army now has two modern guided missile systems to supplement its cannon artillery. Lance and Pershing are reliable, mobile, and powerful, and able to operate under extreme weather conditions. They give the field artillery the long thrust it needs to support far-flung armor and airborne operations, and to deter any would-be aggressor.